mean, the last time we talked about this, the idea was that maybe this would be either the culmination of a trilogy or that you might look at extending it. Has that viewpoint changed for you at all after this third book and releasing it and, and looking at it? Actually, that changed uh, last November because I always do uh, NaNoWriMo actually with mm -hmm. a group. Like I don't do uh -huh. it alone. And I wrote book four. So oh, it's, yes, it's, it's in rough <laughs> stages, but it will be going into editing by the, before the end of this year. So next year we will have a fourth book. It's not, I don't want to give anything away, but uh -huh. it is part, it will be part of this series. And so now I feel like there's probably going to be at least six, just because oh. I can see where the story is going. I know. And when I wrote the first book, <laughs> I was just trying to see if I could write a novel. So I didn't right. even know. I'm pretty excited that this is now actually a trilogy. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so, I mean, in, in that in that idea then, did you have to shift anything that you were planning in this third book because you now have a fourth book and now it's going to be a five and a six? Or did you stick with the original game plan as far as this third book goes? Yeah, the ending didn't change at all, um, but I put like a little, I guess it's an epilogue, right? Mm -hmm. um, because once I knew where the fourth one was going, I could just give a little bit of a teaser. Um, and actually, like, I left the ending the way it was, but I really go into the psychedelic hallucination very fiction world for this guy in book three. Mm. So having a little epilogue was um, actually recommended by my editor in order to just make sure everybody knew exactly what was going on at the end there. Uh -huh. And so it actually worked out really well because I had drafted the fourth one. I knew where it was going and I could give a little hint, but also make sure everything was crystal clear and you knew what was like real and what wasn't real when you closed the book. So you, you've been on this journey with Detective Mahoney now, and, and I'm kind of curious creating that. Where, where, where are we when we start this book for, for Mr. Mahoney? Uh, so even in the first book, I did like just mention, you know, lightly sprinkle in that there was a case like over 10 years ago that didn't work out they never caught the guy and this has been haunting him and it's part of his hallucinations that he has mm. so this this is a chance now in book one and two you know book one he's pretty by the book he pretty mm. much sticks to the rules even though he doesn't always want to he he does stray a little bit but you can tell he's you know he doesn't always want to and then book two it's back to back serial killers. It's terrible. And there it's all intertwined. So you can see him starting to go off the rails a little bit, but you're, mm -hmm. you're still, you're like, okay, but you know, he didn't do anything that crazy, I guess. But then in book three, you know, he's right at the beginning, something happens and he's really not okay. And that's all I'll say. And then we kind of jump forward in time where he's pulled back in and it is the case from whatever it's 16 years ago that never got solved and it's out in big city Toronto and because he was on it when it went cold he gets called back in and you know his boss is kind of like yeah I don't know you don't seem like you're okay but I'm gonna put you on this anyways so when he goes out there he's not on his turf and he's not the boss anymore and it's just a ridiculous kind of you know, a bunch of clowns running this show. And so I think he's now, I've been, I've just completely embraced the fact that he doesn't care about the rules and he cares about catching this killer and he doesn't care how it ends. He just needs to stop this guy. And so for me, that was a lot of fun because I do love a good tight investigation, but right. this is so much more fiction fiction, like without having to stick to the rules, as long as you justify, like, I feel like the reader will be, believe that he would do this because he's getting that desperate we know well enough having have conversations before that music it plays a big role in setting the tone for these books and this one has the gothic theme to it is that is that correct yes yeah. yes and so so with the gothic aspect of it did you find yourself getting darker a little bit more with with within this story mm -hmm. or was it is, did it stay the stay within the context of what the first two books kind of brought about, or was it 
a darker feel to it for you. I do think it's a darker feel. So the first book is really just focused on 80s metal, mm -hmm. um, which is, can be pretty angry and wild. But the second one, you know, there's still the 80s metal, but then there's a strong theme of 70s acid rock, which uh -huh. gets pretty creepy because the serial killer and the detective both have this love for the Lizard King and that comes out and you see like it kind of makes them seem like almost the same guy, you know, and you wonder like how different are they really? And then the third one, definitely darker because I do have 80s metal. There's some skid row. There's always some guns and roses. You know, it's like it's in it's in a lot of scenes. It's in sex scenes. Okay. It's in live music scenes. It's in the bar. It's everywhere. But the gothic metal. So I actually, you know, a lot of people say that Black Sabbath were the original goth metal band without even necessarily saying because they didn't try to fit in the box right they just right. were who they were so there is some black sabbath there's actually um quite a bit of marilyn manson because in the late 80s he was doing the marilyn manson and the spooky kids and if you've never listened to that it's pretty bizarre pretty bizarre <laughs> uh and then i go right into if you remember the band called typo negative uh -huh. and it's perfect because the, the serial killer in this one has a real love for gothic metal, especially typo negative. And the serial killer, so serial killers have a bunch of paraphilias. And in this one, my dear Chester has vampirism, which is actually a real thing. So if you ever heard of real serial killers like um, uh, the, the vampire of Sacramento there, Richard Chase, and there's a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. They did have this thing called vampirism. And yes, it's it's pretty much what you think it is. So he has this. And so he's he turns into this glam night creature. And his backdrop, his soundtrack is a lot of Black Sabbath and Typo Negative. And Typo Negative is like the ultimate characterization of goth metal. Because they tell, I mean, the guy sounds like a vampire. He looks like a vampire. He plays the role in the videos. And the story is sad and dark and dramatic, which really the story of the serial killer in this book, it's sad and it is dramatic. And I think people are going to feel for this guy because you get to see everything that's happened to him. And I'm mm. not saying you're going to be like, oh, it's okay that he's killing all these people, but you will see why he is so broken and sad and why his journey is so uh, dramatic. So definitely, yes, it's a very dark story for both the detective and the serial killer. But, you know, that's what the genre is. And that's where it had to go. And putting it in Toronto, a bigger city with a, you know, a big worldwide view, even back in the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Uh, do you do, did you have to do something different in terms of like, setting wise or research wise that you hadn't done in the first two books because you had them locally for yourself? I guess maybe a little more research, but because this is in 1989, uh, all mm -hmm. the places that I just kind of imagined in my head, I mean, they just existed in Toronto in the late eighties. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun with it. I have a map of where he stays, where he drinks, where he, where the murder scenes are. So all of the murder scenes are molded after actual parks. And there is actually a Gothic cemetery in Toronto that's yeah. been around a long time. So that just absolutely was the best place for a murder scene for me right um but a lot of <laughs> totally. fun because for example where he stays is called the have a nap hotel and this place actually still existed until not that long ago and the have a nap in the early or sorry in the 70s when he was there for the case originally and they stayed in the have a nap it was nice it was on the main street and you know this it was getting a lot of tourists coming in so they booked this have a nap show up and realize oh now it's like the hookers and blow hotel outside of the main <laughs> core and that's where they're staying because their budget is so tight so it's funny you know and there's a place called the chicken house and this place literally it, it i think it's been torn down now but it, it was in existence until not that long ago there's no chicken there if you look at the reviews people are like this place is terrible. There's no chicken here. Why is it called the chicken house? It's basically plates of Doritos and Miller Lite. And so I use that <laughs> when he needs to go somewhere off the grid and meet up with his 
criminal profiler that yes, she's back. So people will like that. And they meet and she walks in and she's like, I'm starving. How's the chicken? You know, and he's like, well, there's no chicken here. And she's like, what? So things like that, that just, I did the research of what existed in those years. And, you know, and you can find photos of these places and what they look like inside. And, and just, there were so many great settings for the book and the kind of mm -hmm. uh, theme I have and the kind of settings that I love to write. You know, I, I'm curious as, as we see the covers behind you and down below, uh, this went through a major rebranding and we, we've talked before about your marketing prowess and your branding aspects of who you are and what you do. What made you make the decision to do this now? Well, yeah. So the, the third, I redid all this, uh, the last six months has been basically, redo all of the covers get them so first of all the first two covers they were my art projects they were very personal and the people in my life locally you know they love them i've had lots of great feedback but the reality is uh they weren't they they don't work online so if you're somebody on amazon you're looking for this kind of book you're looking for certain things and first of all they didn't look like they belonged to a series. And as you can see now they do. And second of all, it, they didn't really convey the subgenre um, well enough to, to, to really have a strong presence in the online world. And I do well at these in-person launches and selling books in person. I would like to expand my skill set to be able to sell more books online. And so part of it was you have to let go of those personal covers. And I actually had these done by a hundred covers and I would highly recommend them. Um, somebody I really trust recommended them. And I had the first one done and just absolutely, I mean, if you know me at all, mm -hmm. This speaks my voice, but also <laughs> when you put it against the other books in the subgenres that these books belong in, it fits, it works. Somebody's going to see it. They're going to know that book is going to give me the kind of story I like. So they nailed it. So we went ahead and did all three. They actually give really good pricing for series. And for the third book, I did a massive package with them and got a whole bunch of stuff and just a brilliant, brilliant job. The other thing that pushed me over the edge to do it this way, I joined a mastermind uh, this year and it's his name is Daniel Wilcox. He's amazing. Um, I have worked with him on writing projects, but he also does a lot of coaching um, and he has like a, a, an online writing group that is just fantastic. And he, he spun off this mastermind and I joined it and there was only about six of us in this. It was a tight knit group. And I was in January redo. I was trying to redo these three covers myself mm -hmm. and I was doing them and doing them and doing them, asking these people for help. And finally, you know, they kind of all said to me, like, do you like how much time do you really want to be spending on this? Because I think they were getting the impression that I was so frustrated and I, I, I was ready to admit that maybe this isn't where I should spend my time. <laughs> but I just I just didn't realize it until someone said, you know what, do you want to try having someone else do these? And as soon as that idea was put out there, I realized, yeah, you know what I really do because I want to spend more time writing and I don't want to spend all this time doing this. And maybe I need somebody outside, like, you know, objectively outside of this, um, these stories that are part of this journey that could just look at it and know something about the business side of things and do them so that they fit in. And so letting go of it was just like amazing. And like I said, um, I still was a little bit stressed at first, but as soon as I got to know the project manager who managed these for me uh, from the hundred covers side of things, I like, I totally built a great uh, relationship built on trust with her. And uh, you know, they will do, they, they work on this until they know you're happy basically. So it was a really good process. I'm curious if you can give us a little bit of, you know, mas masterminding a little bit as well in terms of how to really, I mean, you're, you're perfecting this art form of, of kind of incorporating music into the setting, into the atmosphere, into the storylines and, and using real music that we would all be aware of and not, you know, and obviously you're probably throwing some fictional basis in there as well, but uh, give give some insight into 
the art of perfecting that and 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 nuancing that in a in a manner of that it's professionally done you know you know what i mean not, not in a like i'm i'm throwing guns and roses in there and and just deal with oh, it yeah. you know kind of idea yeah. otherwise you know more of how to incorporate it theme wise and and aesthetically it, it, more more than just putting guns and roses in a book yeah Right. So in the, I'll give you a concrete example. Um, in the first book, each of the murder scenes is actually the killer is imitating an MTV video. Mm. Now I didn't just go out and randomly pick videos. So let me just clarify. 80s metal is my life. Like all day, every day, <laughs> my husband will be like, does it really have to be all day, every day? I'm like, yes. <laughs> so I love it so much. And I'm always listening to new bands too. Like, don't get me wrong, but that's just my core. And so when I wrote the first murder mystery, I just had this idea that, the, you know, the murder scene should be modeled after MTV videos because in the late eighties, they were so dramatic and there was so much emotion around them. And the killer is very emotional and he's got a great backstory. So I just, I watched a lot. I rewatched ones that I was already in love with. And I just found the perfect ones that conveyed his message. So if you know your character's backstory you know what his his or her wounds are, and you go out there and you find it's not the music, but if you find some kind of art or music or some other form of expression that conveys that, you know, you already know their story, and then you're sincerely combining something that really fits. Now, the other part of it is all of my books have bar scenes, live music scenes, because I love going into skid bars. There's so much to experience in these places. I love live music. I'm always going to live music. So for me, I'm basically writing what it was like for me to be up at the front near the stage, sweating it out, absolutely in love with this band at this moment. Like I've had a lot of really good music experiences in my life. So they come, that emotion and that experience and what I'm describing, I've been in a lot of these places I'm using and I've experienced those feelings. And I really do just love music that much. Like this band that I had for my book launch, they are an original band. They have two albums and they love, they are just, they're like me. They're so passionate about their music, the way I'm passionate about my stories that we ended up collaborating artists with artists and promoting each other. And that experience, that book launch was, I was up there sweating it out in their face. They were in my <laughs> face. It was like, that is real. Like people that love their own music that much that they're on there playing it as if it was their last show, you know? So yeah. I guess the long story here is, let's shorten this up a little, is if you are going to bring in other influences, you know what? Use the ones that you love, the ones that are part of who you are. I ended up writing what's in me. And at first mm -hmm. I thought it was really weird. And I thought I had a lot of doubt, but then I realized, no, I'm writing what's in me, what I'm passionate about. When I create these scenes, they're so based on my own experiences that they really come to life off the page. So use what you love. Now I do stick uh, to the timelines quite closely. There's a little bit of tweaking here and there, but I really do try to stick to when songs were released or when bands were around and what sure. videos and what, yeah. And so there is a bit of checking because of course I don't remember all the dates and I do have to check things. Um, but for the most part, it's pretty spot on and the little tiny tweaks, I don't know if people would notice, but I think that's important too. Um, because People that are really into that, you know, people that are into bands, they will remember songs mm -hmm. and dates and times. Oh, so yeah. I remember my learn. first concerts and everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so write what you know, write what you're passionate about, and then it won't seem like you're just throwing it in there, you know? You so I you know it's funny where we've talked probably through every single launch that you've had of these books, and I don't think we've ever brought this up. And it's got to be a huge part, especially of this book. But you and I grew up during this time and we learned uh, and, and some of some of it is embarrassing, but some of it is not. Some of it you, I kind of wish do, did come back. And that's the fashion aspect of, of oh, yeah. the characters and things. 
Yeah. You know, and it's kind of interesting looking back at that, you know, thinking about the 80s and then, of course, thinking about metal fashion and gothic fashion and uh, how much of that is, I mean, is that that's obviously a huge influence in this story, especially with the gothic flair, I would assume. So, uh, I mean, do you have like flashbacks and things like that when you look at this stuff or, and it kind of? And go, yeah, all right. The, this is how yeah. t-shirts were back then and what we wore at concerts and stuff like that. Well, I don't know that I ever left that time period. So <laughs> I do, my husband does make fun of my closet sometimes, but um, I have a lot of glitter and glam and I just think that it makes life better. So definitely, yeah, when I'm researching to remind myself because I don't have everything I used to have when right. I was in high school, but I have a lot of things that are very eighties metal glimmer glam and I wear them. I just do. <laughs> um, but uh, it is fun though, because there are some really extreme looks that of course aren't really around anymore that when you look these things up, you think, gosh, what were we thinking? And I mean, <laughs> I do do some big hair and stuff, but I guess not yeah. as big. Like I had really big hair when I was in high school <laughs> and I had leg warmers and I had the stirrup pants and I don't have all of that stuff, but yeah. um, it's amazing though, how fashion cycles, because uh, this year I've noticed it's a lot harder to find that stuff. But last year when um, I was out shopping, or I guess two years ago, sorry, because last year a lot of things were closed, but two years ago, it was everywhere. Like finding yeah. leather and finding crazy pants, it was everywhere. It was easy to find. Now it's getting a little harder. Um, but everybody at the party, I'd say over half the people really dressed 80s, really dressed metal. And some of them went out and bought stuff to wear. And uh, some of them go to vintage stores. Some of them go to, like, there's a, a place called Hot Topic in Calgary that has some pretty yeah. cool metal stuff. So you can too. still find it. But, like, like, yeah, I mean, some of the stuff you can't find anymore. I mean, there used to be like matching knitted suits that guys would wear and stuff like that. And it's like, that is definitely not coming back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's funny because I was looking uh, the other day at um, uh, something that I remember very fondly from my from my growing up as a teenager was Doc Martens. And uh they're coming back into the fold now too and, and, and authenticating them because that was really important to, to be authentic. You know, you had the labeling and the branding is very, uh, you know, important yeah. when it came to fashion and being authentic, because yeah. if you didn't, you were kind of poserish and it, it, yeah. it didn't, it didn't work as well. Right. So yeah, dark are, you, are, you, are huge now. Yeah. Are you, are you uh, cognitive of that idea too, that, that there was an authenticity that, that really, really yes. mattered? My, the killer in the first book, uh, he leaves a footprint, which turns out to be a size 12 Doc Martin. And so <laughs> it was very important because if you're, uh, he was, he was part of that scene. He loved it. Like rock and roll was his heroine basically. And so, yes, the authenticity is very important, you know, and the criminal profiler, she's got a leather jacket and she wears, you know, blouses with ruffles and, and rhinestone bracelets and like the kind of look you would have if you were a little more out there in the late eighties, that's the kind of stuff you'd wear. And so that's, you know, you know, and it's funny because the detective wears his herringbone jacket and you know, <laughs> his like old his old fashioned hat, and they make fun of him yeah. because he's yeah. you know kind of vintage, and and you know in eighties that would be vintage from the seventies, right? So, <laughs> and you're right though, fashion does come back into play. I mean, it just recycles itself. Yeah. Uh, where has Killers and Demons evolved for you since the last time we talked? What are you doing more? of and where is that brand going for you well i've the series is continued uh, or mm -hmm. will be continuing um mm -hmm. uh but more than that the uh the the pure horror that i've been writing i've just embraced that it's always going to be some kind of 80s feel some kind of metal feel and so all the stories that i've written and all the other short novellas and other stuff that i've worked on there's just there is that feel so whether it's the detective books or other more pure horror 
um, there is that 80s metal murder feel to it. And so I've just completely embraced that that's what my writing is. But also just going forth, like it's great to have a trilogy. I had no idea I would be able to get to this point. <laughs> but having released in the, a bunch of other works as well with other people and also on my own, I didn't think I would be able to do that much in this time frame. Um, so I guess it's just it's made me see that yes, I can do this because I have a lot of self doubt. I've really, I'm somebody who struggled with that over my life. And, and I feel like I've really worked on that now because I actually do believe in this. Um, and so much so that I actually had an opportunity to take some uh, courses on, on script writing and I've been wanting to do that. So final track. Now there is a script. It is very rough. Nice but there is a path that is starting to open for, for that, for me to work on that and get some actual professional advice on that. So um, who knows where that will go, but <laughs> I'm at least throwing myself into it and believing it and just trying it and see, just see what happens. Right. This was the type of place you didn't look into the corners of. He hoisted himself up onto a high chair at the bar. A young woman wrapped in tight black leather, spattered in silver buckles, slithered toward him. What can I get you? Her blood red lips moved, exposing bright white teeth. Beer. Well, you'll have to be more specific than that. We've got choices. She ran her obsidian coated fingernail along a series of taps. A pint of club, please. Urine like liquid filled the glass, bubbling at the top. She slid the glass over the bar. 350, cash only, pay as you go. Pulling his tattered wallet from his back pocket, he slid several bills across the counter. They caught on a slimy pink, pink gob. He pulled them up, pink goo stretching along. It snapped as it let go. He handed her the bills and retreated his hand with haste, avoiding the countertop. A deep rumble vibrated behind him and across the dirt smeared wooden floor. The stool he was perched on shook. He twisted to face the stage behind him. Several leather and chain clad young men had taken the stage and were setting up drums and guitars. A thick man with the beard of an unkempt mountain beast leaned over the cords at the back of the stage, exposing more crack than Mahoney had planned on seeing through the course of the evening. A man with dark locks approached the microphone at the center of the stage. His black painted lips caressed the metal bulb. Check, check. His smooth voice eased into Mahoney's ear. Satan's sorrow. Mahoney turned to face the bar. You have seen them before? Uh, no, first time here. They're good. Raw, rough, real guttural. She ran her tongue over her top lip. You need anything else before the show starts? Red lips glared into the purple and blue lights dotting the bar. Hell, I'm already here. Why not have the full dive bar experience? Maybe he could lose himself in another world. Uh, yeah. You got bourbon? 